Well, good morning, friends. I'd love to talk with you all about love for just a few minutes. And I can't talk about love without talking about my babies. It is one thing to say that you love God, but the path to God goes right through humanity. One of the things that I know in this day and age, maybe even more than ever, is that lots and lots of people talk about their faith and how religious they are. But if you wanna show me that you love God, show me what you're doing for God's children. Okay. And it starts with our babies. I've been fortunate to travel to around 40 different countries around the world, and I know that there's lots of things that we are not gonna agree on. We may not agree on some political things, we may not agree on some economic things, but the one thing that I know in my bones to be true is that everywhere that I have gone, people love their babies. And they want the same thing for their babies as I do. They want food in their belly, they want a roof over their head, and they want dignity in their soul. And I used to know that up here until my baby Roya was born. And I thought I knew a thing or two about love. I had spent a couple of decades of my life reading books of love poetry and love mysticism, and then I held her in my arms. And when she opened up those eyes and she looked at me, something happened. And something keeps happening every time that she looks at me. Um, tonight is her prom. <laughs> and I am going to leave y'all <laughs> to go have a dance with my baby. Because she still wants to dance with her baba. Right. Um, I thought I loved my mama, and I do, and I thought I loved my baba, and I do. But when I held my daughter, my heart got bigger. I didn't love my mom less. I didn't love my dad less. The capacity to love grew, right? That's what scripture means when it says, Alam nashrah laka sadrak, didn't we open up your heart for you? There is a love that opens you up. And then when my son, Amir, was born, he's now taller than me, he's got a beard, but he's still my little boy. And when I held him, I didn't love my daughter any less. The heart got bigger to encompass him. And then when my daughter Layla was born, when I met my beloved Corina, the heart keeps getting bigger. That's one of the teachings of the path of love. That love compels you to grow beyond what we've seen as the limit of ourself we start to see love not as some emotion, right? As I sometimes joke with people, love is not an emoji, <laughs> right? Love is not something you text people. And love is not even something that you feel. Love is actually the very unleashing of God onto this realm. It is the very being of the divine. And at some point, we come to see that it's this love that brought us here. It's this love that sustains us here. And if we merge with it, the same love will carry us back home. Right? This is the path of love that all of our traditions teach, using different stories and different symbols. One of the things that I want to do is just to share a couple of teachings that have touched my heart, and I hope that they will also touch yours. 
So in our tradition, the Sufi context, they encourage you to think about how does your love lead you to serve people? If you love somebody, you serve somebody. And this was very real when I think about my own babies, right? Yes, they're cute and cuddly. They don't always smell good. And then they wake up in the middle of the night every four hours and they cry. When people talk about you sleep like a baby, that's what they mean. You wake up crying every four hours. And you get woken up and in that moment, you're faced with a choice. You're tired, you're sleepy, you have not had eight hours of sleep for decades. <laughs> but your baby is crying, and at that moment, you don't sit there with a pro and con list. You don't rationalize, there is no intellect involved anymore. Your baby's crying, and love compels you to get out of bed and go pick up your child and hold her against you and comfort her. There is a love that transcends reason, and there's a love that even transcends choice. You've just surrendered to this love. Right? That's when you know that this love is washing you of your ego, of your selfish quality. And so the teachers of this path, and we're blessed to have two of them from two beautiful traditions on stage with us, they encourage us to think about, as the great song used to say, how deep is your love and how wide is your love? How wide is your circle of compassion. You gotta love yourself. If you loathe yourself, you're probably gonna loathe other people too. If you loathe the color of your skin, the texture of your hair, the shape of your nose, or in my case, the lovely round way that God made me, <laughs> you're probably gonna hate a few other people who resemble you too. But if the circle of your compassion only extends to yourself, well, congratulations, you're a narcissist, <laughs> right? If love compels you to project yourself beyond yourself, and you love your baby, you love your mama, you love your baba, but you say, oh, you know, I'll love, but I'm only gonna love my family and nobody else. Okay, congratulations, you've transcended narcissism and you're stuck at nepotism. <laughs> then sometimes love compels you a little more and you say, okay, I'm willing to love everybody that looks like me. I'll go beyond the family, look at everybody. Congratulations, you're a racist. <laughs> Clap for yourself, you know? Love compelled you to grow and say, you know what? America. Love everybody who lives inside these imaginary lines. Congratulations, you're a bigoted nationalist. <laughs> you say, I will love everybody who bows down and prays to God or goddesses the same way as I do. Hmm. You're a religious bigot. What if love compels you and to say, one God, one humanity, and that the same one God who loves who creates, who feeds, who nurtures, who redeems, and who calls us home, compels us to swim in this cosmic current of love with absolutely no exceptions. That we love 
for every sentient being. Every blade of grass, every tree, every flower, every human being, born and unborn, past and future. That's a love that's like sunshine. That's a love that's divine. And that's the love that we're called to participate in. The teachings of our traditions also tell us that this love is divine. The prophet Muhammad has a beautiful saying in which he encourages us to think about the ways that God introduces herself, himself, to us. We're told that God has a hundred names, a hundred qualities. One of them is hidden. There's always something that's hidden, right? The Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. In the Jewish tradition, we've even forgotten the real vowels and how to pronounce the name of God. The Holy Grail has to be lost, so we go searching for it, right? And in Islam, we're told that there's a name of God that's hidden, but the other names we're told about, and when you start studying the Quran, the beginning of every chapter, except one, starts with these same two divine qualities, Rahman and Rahim. Rahman and Rahim, the infinitely merciful, the especially Especially tender. The infinitely merciful, expansive and wide, and the laser beam focus of loving tenderness. God has a hundred qualities, a hundred names. And think about all the different qualities that you and I have. Right? I am a son, a partner a father, a student, a friend, a teacher, a neighbor. I have a name that my mama gave me. And what would it be like if when I meet you, and you're like, tell me something about yourself. And I keep telling you the same two things. I am Roya's Baba, Roya's daddy. And I am Ali and Puran's son. And then I meet somebody else. Tell me something about yourself. I am Roya's daddy. And I am Ali and Puran's son. If I do that a hundred times over and over again, you'd be like, yeah, I guess these are two things that are really important to him. And of those hundred qualities of God, the all-knowing, the all-just, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the manifest and the hidden, the two qualities that God wants to introduce himself herself by, the infinitely merciful, the lovingly, specially tender. You would think these are important qualities for understanding God. Arabic, just like Hebrew, sacred language, which operates on a root system. If you want to know the meaning of a word, you got to go into the roots. It's like a tree. You got to dig a little deeper. And the roots of a word are what gives you the heart meaning, the essence meaning. I remember when I was trying to teach my son about Rahman and Rahim, and these words compassionate and merciful didn't mean anything to him. They're like, and he was almost said sarcastically, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, <laughs> eye roll included. And then I remember that teaching from the prophet that said, these two qualities of God, the Rahman and the Rahim, come from the word Rahim, which means a womb. A womb. So think about this. We are told in our faith tradition that the divine transcends gender. God is no more he 
then God is she. And there are masculine qualities and feminine qualities. But so many of the names that we use come from the masculine side. God the king. God the ruler. In some languages, not in Islam, God the father. People have no problem, our heavenly father. And then if you pray in the name of our heavenly mother, they have a conniption. <laughs> They're like, why are you projecting gender onto the divine? I'm like, you've been praying in the name of God the Father for centuries, <laughs> right? Well, that's separate. The prophet says, and later mystics like Ibn Arabi say, these divine qualities of Rahman and Rahim, the compassionate and the especially tender, come from the root of a womb. And then they add, it is as if, ka'anna, it is as if we are contained inside the womb of the Divine Mother. It is as if you and I and the whole cosmos is contained inside God's womb, the ultimate maternal symbol. Where I want to end and introduce the conversation with our friends is this. So much of the time when we pray to the divine, we look up as if we are praying to a God who is up there and out there. The feminine aspect of God allows us to change our prayer. There is no divine that is out there, outside of us. We are praying from the inside. We are already inside the divine womb. And in the same way that a mother loves, nurtures, cherishes, and provides for an unborn baby, that is how intimately we are sustained by a divine mother. Without this feminine dimension of the divine, we have half a religion. Let us have a whole faith. If we strive to be whole human beings, let's have a faith that is whole. Then may it be that the circle of love, the circle of compassion encompasses all of us even as we are already inside God's womb. With your permission, we'll now turn it over to our two wonderful teachers that we have, Jamal Nurhoja and Rinpoche. Bismillah. <laughs>